Everything I'm about to discuss are theories and concepts that come directly from me and discussion with many other people. Everybody's entitled to their own theories and ideas. If you talk to somebody else that's been doing, that's been doing this for as long as I have, I'm sure they will disagree with at least some of the things I'm about to say, if not everything I'm about to say. So take everything with a grain of salt. I'm just sharing what has and has not worked for me. Now, moving forward, I haven't actually made a video like this in quite a while. I'm going to be talking about uh, center of gravity or just center of mass, weight distribution, frame layout, just kind of things off the top of my head. Just going to be talking. Um, I think I'll try to put a table of contents in this, but I don't know if I'll have the time to. Let's start with frame geometry and motor layout. So recently there has been this thought or idea of this hybrid layout or hybrid format where the front arms are stretched and the rear arms are six inch. And so a while back, many, not many, well, many years ago in this hobby is like a century ago, but a while back, Brian Morris was actually the first person that I know of that formally recognized that quads that have a longer front to back dimension, a wider stance, more space between the front and back props tend to fly a little bit better or just perform differently. You can see that the quad on top or the frame on top has a longer dimension or sorry, it has a shorter dimension front to back. And so before he recognized that, there were many racing and acro pilots that preferred six inch size frames, but run five inch props on the six inch size frames. And back then, our flight code was not nearly as good as it is today. It was not very good at handling prop wash or many other flight control aspects. And so it really needed all the help it could get. Today, things are a little bit different. Kind of everything flies pretty good but things still can fly better if you kind of set it up correctly. So they realized that six inch frames with five inch props perform better. And so what Brian Morris did was he took a frame design and just kind of squashed the side to side dimension while stretching the front to back dimension. And it seems like it was performing very similar to the six inch frames that had five inch props on it. Now, a little bit more in depth than that, but I'm going to kind of just point out why that is, at least one of the theories why that is. So if you take a look at this frame, I actually don't have an example of a compressed frame distance. Let's try, yeah, I don't have, a comp I don't have an example. So if you look at this frame, if you just look straight down the prop line, I'm going to line up the props, and then I start tipping these, this prop line forward, that's, that's almost no tilt. That's like maybe like four degrees tilt. And you already start seeing separation between the front and the back disc. That means that there's at least a line of fresh air going to the rear props. And there's less interaction between the front and back props. As I keep tipping it forward more and more, you see the spacing between the front and the back props tends to increase pretty quickly. Now, if these props were much closer together, it kind of wouldn't matter how much I tipped the quad. I would never, let's say they were only two millimeters apart. I would never really be able to increase the spacing between front and back props more than two millimeters. So you start getting the front props that are somewhat, at least the theory is starving the rear props of air and that they're sucking a lot of air and the rear props are kind of not getting as much airflow as the front props. Also, you get the front props that are blowing a lot of air down and that that thrust is interacting with the thrust that's coming off the rear props as well. So there's an interaction between the front and back props. And for that reason, having a stretch frame, or at least that's one of the reasons why having a stretch frame or a, just a longer front to back dimension tends to feel better in the air, have more grip, have more performance, actually be a little bit more efficient. It's because the rear props have, have more freedom. They have more air, more room to breathe, more room to do everything that they're supposed to do. Now, a while ago, really a while ago, people used to run six inch props in the back and five inch props in the front, which tended to feel even better along with like um, tilted rotors in the back and not tilted rotors in the front because it just even made it even a little bit better. But now we know that we don't necessarily need to do that. We just need to set up the quad appropriately so that works well. And the end result is that you get much better prop wash handling. You get much better grip, as I said, much better control overall. But we didn't really widen the side to side dimension and that's primarily because of weight distribution, I would say today. Although back then, we just experimented and found out that you didn't really need a wider side to side dimension, which today I would say it's because all your weight is kind of carried in the middle of the quad. So having a longer front to back dimension, which is this is reason number two or theory number two, having a longer front to back dimension means that you have more of a torque lever on the center of mass of the quad 
so that you can kind of balance all the weight and everything a little bit easier as you fly along. Now, flight controllers, I mean, these things are flying robots. It is still beyond me why some things perform better and other things do not perform the same. Like, there's so many little tiny things that are mixed into it, and this is kind of something that I really love about the whole hobby in general, is that we have computers and everything is, is a machine, however, there's still some sort of organic mechanics behind it, and things still need to work mechanically well for it to actually perform well in the code or in the flight processing systems as well. Now, that may be an indication of our flight code being immature, and there will be more to come, because technically these things are robots. There's nothing that we shouldn't be able to do in software, or at least compensate for poor hardware in software. Maybe that'll come in the future, but let's just talk about this discussion today. So the other concept I want to talk about is, so I hope you understood the whole stretch versus wide everything. People today still prefer running five inch props on six inch frames for that very reason that you have a wider stance. Everything has a wider, bigger, longer torque lever. So it's kind of easier for the flight controller to kind of get hold of all of the mass and, and just really manage the whole quad nicely. Now there are ways to make things smaller and tighter because I know everybody loves a small quad. Nobody wants to fly something massive on a regular basis unless it's like 10 feet wide, <laughs> like an X-class craft or something ridiculous, which is awesome for it to be massive. If you're going for big, then you're gonna do big. But if you're not going for big, you really prefer it to be nice and tidy and small and you don't wanna have a whole lot of quad to deal with in the air to fit through gaps and whatnot. So there are ways that you can get it tighter and still maintain the same flight performance and that's kind of what I have personally strived towards and moved towards. So now let's talk about the battery underneath the quad. So for this quad, let's say this is a, this is a racing class quad, so I'm going to use this as, a, as an example. What we've been doing historically is that if you look at where the weight of this quad actually is, without any battery, you see that the weight of the quad is primarily like, let's just say the center mass is right here. The stuff in the middle doesn't really weigh all that much. It, it weighs something, but it's not, it's not that much compared to all the motors. Most of the weight of this quad is carried by the frame and the motors all out at the ends. The middle section is less than 50% of the rest of the weight. So this stuff is not really making that big of a difference. The battery that you swing underneath the quad is a significant weight. This is gonna be like 120 grams or something. That's, that's about half the weight of this quad. So putting this battery on the quad really is gonna change its center of mass, not weight distribution. I'll get to weight distribution in a minute. In a minute. So the center of mass of this quad with the battery on board, let's say we put the battery flat on the bottom like this, the center of mass is gonna be like down here somewhere. It's gonna be below the prop line. What that means is that if you tilt this quad forward, which is in like actual flight angle, where is the center of mass? It's it's right here. It's it's sort of if you look at it from a front to back distance, like the quad is only being this wide. On like if you flatten the whole image, you're looking at just just this flat image front to back distance. The the weight is actually further back than the center of the quad. So I'm pointing right here, which is where the weight, the center of mass actually is. And that's not actually ideal. Ideally, you would want the center of mass, not the weight distribution, not the center of weight distribution. Weight distribution is different. You want the center of all the mass to be right between the blades, right between the blades right here, both on the Z axis as well as the X and Y. X and Y is not really a challenge because it's quads are pretty much symmetrical, but the Z axis really does make a difference. So if your center of mass is below that prop line distance, as you tip forward, your center of mass is actually moving backwards. So the quad needs to do more work in the back, the rear props, which are already being starved for air and have a lot of interaction with the thrust coming off the props in the front. Those props need to work a lot harder and do a lot more to swing this weight and manage this weight and move it around and do everything that it needs to do. So historically what we've done is we just slide the battery forward. And what that does is it really just moves the center of mass forward. When you're in this angled stance, when you're, when you're angled, when you're flying forward in a race setting, like race status, a, a forward slid battery moves the weight right in line where it needs to be. So what we find out is that the quad actually handles a whole lot better, has a lot more grip, a lot more performance with that weight swinging forward. However, for acro purposes, if you have a mass that's forward like this, in acro we're not flying like racing quads all the time. We're, we're like floating around, we're not like really high on the throttle always. So if you pump the throttle like this, the quad needs to do more work in the front 
in order to manage this load underneath. And the center of mass is below the prop line and also forward. So it's just like this weird wonky setup. And so previously I discussed the concept of the stretched front and the six inch wide back. That's not really doing a whole lot of work other than having the rear props get even more fresh air. If your rear props were kind of out of line with the front props and further back than the front props, it's kind of getting doubly more fresh air. So while it may or may not be felt on some quads, that's sort of what's happening. And if you're swinging a battery underneath, having number one, a wider front to back dimension to have more fresh air to the rear, as well as wider rear props to get even more air that's fresh to the rear and having less thrust interaction between front and back could technically improve things quite a bit. Now, this is really just a, just a, a guess and uh, it would be really hard to test. And it's also a very big personal preference. And from quad to quad and frame setup to setup, it's really hard to gauge what is actually happening and where it may or may not be improving. But that's at least the theory or the concept behind that kind of stuff. Now, let's look at what happens if we turn the battery sideways. So this is something that hasn't been done a whole lot and I've actually been testing it on uh, my racing quads or racing setups, which I'm not gonna show because they're all prototype quads. When you turn the battery sideways, it actually does change things quite a bit. If you turn the battery sideways and move it forward a little bit, that changes things a whole lot. So let's think about what the quad needs to do when it's in the air. So the quad needs to maintain its attitude before it does anything else. What that means is that if, the, if you put the quad like this angle in the air, it needs to maintain this angulation in the air regardless of any wind blowing or weight wobbling around or anything happening. It wants to maintain its attitude. And before you even begin to give it stick inputs, throttle, pitch, roll, yaw, roll, anything, it needs to maintain this attitude. If it's expending 20% of its power just maintaining this attitude, you're not going to have as much power to execute the movements that you want to move, that you want to do. So if you had a, had a weight that's off center, if you put this weight at the end of this arm, it would take a lot more energy for this quad to maintain its attitude because it's got this weird weight swinging off the side. And when you do flips and rolls and whatever, it's got to zip this prop up way harder than the other blades just to stop it from that pitch and roll because it's got just this more momentum on this corner of the of the quad which makes it much more difficult for it to manage so that really does impact flight performance quite a bit now if you look at these quads the reason why the p on these quads have historically or is are always higher than the the um sorry the p in the pitch axis is always higher than the roll axis is because there's a lot more weight in the front to back dimension. So when you do do a flip or roll and it needs to zip to do a stop, what the P tells it is that how much power is it allowed to use to do its attitude hold movements. So when it's zipping to a stop, the P tells it how much power to use for it to stop, for it to execute various moves, for it to do everything. And so in the pitch axis, there's more weight. So it needs more power to deal with the weight on the pitch axis. On a quad like this, or let's just say, well, let's move back to this one. On a quad like this, when you put the battery underneath, there is still more weight in the pitch axis. Now, if you have a stretch frame, you get the benefit of having a longer torque lever to manage this weight. Like I said previously, that does help tremendously. And that's, like I said, Reason number two, was it two or three? Uh, I don't remember, whatever it is. That's another reason why having this stretched frame will help quite a bit because you have a longer torque lever to manage the weight of the frame. Now what, or weight of the whole quad. Now what happens, and then when, you, when it's easier to manage the whole weight of the quad, then you have less energy being expended to maintain your attitude in the air, and then you have more control, more energy to expend towards actual control of the quad or stick inputs or whatever. It can execute your movements easier. So what happens when you move the battery sideways? Now all of a sudden, we have cut a whole lot of weight from the front to back dimension. And I think um, Willie actually, or Willard made a video about this and why he likes running toilet tank on his aqua quads. I actually didn't watch it. I think I watched like the first couple seconds and I had to like go do something at work. Anyways, when you run the battery sideways, even underneath the quad, you are reducing the load on the quad to maintain 
its attitude in the pitch direction. Now, the reason why I'm focusing on pitch is because that's something that doesn't really change a whole lot. Sure, we do flips and rolls or whatever, but in a race setting or just cruising or just flying in general, we pretty much keep the pitch locked in one direction. And that's also the direction that the quad is usually feeling all the drag and all the various movement of, of stuff, these little fine micro movements that we do in the pitch direction, that's something that the quad needs to manage and maintain. Roll is something that's typically mostly neutral. Sorry, I had something in my mouth that spit out. Roll is typically something that's neutral and doesn't really change unless we give it stick inputs. Now it does change and it does matter as well, but what we're doing here by putting the battery sideways is that we're kind of balancing the pitch and the roll weight distribution. And when you do that, I've just said weight distribution. That's like I said, that's a totally different concept. It's weight distribution. And I've already been talking about weight distribution as well, but I'm just going to jump to that. So we're distributing the weight distribution on the pitch and the roll axis such that it makes it easier for the quad to maintain all that stuff. So yes, it still technically has more weight in the pitch direction and you still need more P in the pitch direction because that is the, the, the axis that needs to be most locked and most in control for the rest of the quad to be able to function. There's a lot more to that I'm not gonna get into. But just moving the battery sideways, even on a racing quad, has made quite a big difference and just moving it forward just a little bit for those reasons. So on the acro quad or the racing quads that I'm, that I'm testing, I have designed a number of designs that have um, the battery sideways underneath. And I'm finding that before or right now, for some reason, not for some reason, uh, racers like 1300 milliamp 6S batteries, which is just like bonkers. It's like a 2000 milliamp 4S battery, which is crazy that we've reached that status. But with a sideways battery underneath, I can run up to an 1100 milliamp 6S battery and I cannot even begin to feel the difference between having the battery underneath and on top. Now that has a lot to do with the power of the quad as well, but with typical racing quads that we have set up today, having the battery sideways underneath does allow you to run a little bit more battery weight without having it impact your actual control. Now, a lot of people prefer battery underneath because they say when they come around turns, it allows the quad to like swing around the turn. I think that's complete rubbish, <laughs> just the worst concept ever. But this is my opinion and my opinion alone. Many people actually do prefer the battery being underneath, aside from the fact that when you crash, you have a much less of a chance of actually destroying your battery because it's not the first thing that impacts the pole that you just hit. They actually prefer the battery underneath because they say it allows them to swing around turns easier, which fine, maybe they're used to it, maybe they like it, whatever. In my opinion, it's the worst, po worst possible feeling. I do not want my quad to swing around willy-nilly without my input. So I have found that having the battery sideways underneath really does help a lot. Now let's just jump to, oh yeah, another thing I want to say about the battery sideways underneath. So I've done a whole lot of testing of these micro stuff lately, and I found that the micro stuff, I've known this for a long time, micro stuff is actually much more um, sensitive to everything than five inch quads and bigger quads that have a lot more power. And so on my, on my toothpick style quads or just micro quads, I run the battery underneath if it's the appropriate weight for the quad, which I only really know by testing. I run the battery sideways for that very reason, and I found that it really does make quite a difference on my micro setups, especially when the battery is underneath the quad. Keep that in mind, I'll get to more about that a little bit later. So if you look at my acro designs and my acro quads, you'll see that I don't actually design toilet tank style frames. I mean, I have in the past, but I just don't because it's just awkward. It doesn't matter how wide the front to back dimension is. The, if When you put the battery sideways, you don't have a lot of frame and stuff to like lock the battery in place. Whereas this way, I have two straps that lock the battery in. If I wanted to make it as secure sideways, I'd have to make my frame wider and weirder and so it's gonna add a whole bunch more weight and weight is always a concern and it's always an issue. So I just don't wanna do that. On top of that, look how my battery is set up. I mean, my battery is on top of the frame. This strap is holding the battery and this battery lead connector there. When I plug this thing in, that thing is not moving at all, ever. There's no way my balance lead can get hit by a prop. There's no way any of my leads can even begin to get near a prop. Even though they are close, they're not gonna get near any of my blades doesn't matter what branch I hit, what I hit, nothing is going to move and get in the way. Whereas if your battery is sideways, your battery can kind of jumble a little bit, or if you, have, if you only have one strap holding the battery, it can like twist. And then it kind of gets dangerously close to your props. 
And sure, there are people that kind of only run their batteries sideways, and they have gotten really used to maintaining their wires and not having them be sliced, but it doesn't matter how you do it. Unless you're adding a whole lot more weight to the frame to manage that battery being sideways or change the design entirely to make it just different than what we're used to, you put your batteries at a much higher risk of getting sliced by the blades when you run your battery sideways. And it's for that reason why I don't design frames that are sideways, sideways battery, even though the flight performance is genuinely better. It actually is genuinely better depending on the quad. Not all quads feel this improvement with flight performance when the battery is sideways. Now, more recently, pretty much all quads have a minimum of a six to one power to weight ratio, which was kind of my gold standard three years ago, which is what I was, I was trying to target. But now it's so easy to get tons of power out of these quads that does all this really matter all that much. I would say absolutely it does. However, it takes, I would say, a much more skilled pilot to be able to tell the differences in the air. Now, I only kind of test this stuff. I fly for fun, but really mainly to just test stuff because that is fun to me. So I have gotten very used to trying to feel differences in the way the quad performs and trying to kind of pick things apart and figure out, okay, is it the code that's making it fly weird? Is it the weight distribution? Well, what's going on here? How am I going? And I do a lot of things to try and test and figure out why things are the way they are. So when the quad has an immense amount of power, as a lot of these quads do today, they really don't have much issue managing the weight. However, when your weight starts getting a little bit high, it does have a lot of issues managing the weight. And so the reason why I run 23 or 21 or 22 or 20 to 25 millimeter standoffs is because I want my weight, my overall weight to be balanced on the Z axis right between the prop line. And that's, I've gauged this for running a GoPro with a battery, uh, with a, sorry, with a TPU mount along with a battery, 1100 milliamp 6S battery on top with a motor that's seven, six, seven or eight millimeters tall. And that's kind of the gold standard for my frame setup. It's really, a really small range, but it is the vast majority of the market that runs these kinds of these things. And so I run default settings everywhere because defaults just work when your quad is set up very correctly and what Betaflight wants to see. And when, you're, when your weight, when your center mass is actually where it's supposed to be, Betaflight really, or any flight, has really no problems managing the quad in the air, and it gives you much better control, much better performance, much lower prop wash, especially when you have this longer front-to-back dimension, much easier to deal with prop wash. And so it's really easy to make a quad fly fantastic when you follow these kinds of rules. And that's why I, my quads just tend to fly. I get a lot of comments saying, how does your quad fly so well? What are your pids? What are this? Still to this day, when pids don't even matter anymore, still to this day, I get tons of comments asking me how I set up my quads to fly the way they do. And I don't set them up at all. I don't touch my pids. I don't touch anything. That's a totally different matter entirely because those are mixed with filters and so many other things. Sure, I know how to tune, not fine tune, but I know how to do tune and when to change numbers, but I don't change any numbers on the vast majority of my quads. So the thing that I haven't discussed is weight distribution or I haven't discussed as much. Weight distribution does impact things a whole lot, but I'm not. I'm going to talk about it in a weird way. So a while back, people used to run kind of like long sticks off their quad and put like a camera at the end of the stick to kind of capture the quad in third-person view. Something they may have noticed is that when you when you hang a weight off the end of your quad, you tend to lose all performance in terms of control. You can't really control it as well, and that's because the motors are working so hard to manage that weight distribution. Ideally, you would want to have the battery and all the weight as compressed in the center as possible, as tightly focused as you can in the center as possible. Now having weight at the extremities does and does not matter, but it, it doesn't matter in terms of if the weight is motor weight and you're getting more power for that motor weight, then it's not really a big deal because the motor is going to have enough power to manage its own weight. But if the weight comes from adding a ton of TPU or having a ton of like bumper space or extra frame thickness at the end of the, the arm, sure, that's going to impact your, your flight control performance tremendously. And we've moved to five millimeter arms. That's pretty much the standard. But in reality, if you go back to four millimeter arms, the end of the arm is actually thinner. Like the, the, carbon is thinner. You don't need a lot of carbon thickness underneath your motor. I mean, that's the last place you really need durability. You need durability 
in the arm or in this connection between the motor and the arm. You don't need it in the end. It's just unfortunate that we run five millimeter arms now and you have to expend all this extra weight in the end of the motor pad and as well as in the center in the body connection just to have a five millimeter arm. Sure, you can do depth cuts, but that costs a lot more and it actually introduces a lot more failure regions in the arm. So if you actually go back to four millimeter arms, you tend to get better performance, slightly better performance. And so that might be one reason why people think the Flowride, my previous, my original acro frame, flies so nicely. It does fly nicely, but as I'm gonna explain at the very end here, it's there's another reason why I've designed my frames the way I have. So let's now discuss, uh, I discussed weight distribution, let's now discuss the actual power of the quad and what that does to give you good performance and and kind of tie it all together. So if you look at the toothpick quad, the reason why this, this general toothpick setup flies so well, or one of the reasons why I'm assuming why it flies so well, is because you kind of have all the weight. First of all, the weight is really, really low. And you have and you have really large props. I haven't talked about disc loading at all. When you have really large props, it's really easy for the quad to manage all the weight as long as the motors have enough torque to actually change the RPM of the prop appropriately. So that's why the twin blade props that are really large and really, really lightweight and low load work so well on the toothpick class quads. And so when you put the battery on it, the battery goes right underneath and it's like really tightly packed in the middle. So sure, the weight distribution is not fantastic. The, the actual center of mass is not right between the prop line, but the, the whole weight is so tightly packed in the middle that the quad can manage it really easily because there's not a lot of weight all at the extremities floating around to swing around. If you compare that to something like this, which I designed to have the battery on top, you have much wider weight distribution. You have a big battery on top, it's tall sitting on these standoffs, you got all this stuff spaced out. And so the distinction I've been trying to make is weight distribution versus center of mass. The center of mass of this quad might be fantastic, but the weight distribution is not that fantastic because it's all over the place. I mean, you got this huge box here versus having this tight little package in the middle. And so the challenging part of all this is how do you make something that is this big box fly as well as something that's this tight little package. And so the way you do that is by adding a lot of power. You need to have a lot of power on this quad to manage all this weight. So this is one of my uh, my prototypes, one of my very many prototypes that I've, I've designed for um, running like a split in there. And I've kind of really, once again, re-abandoned the whole split again. And that's because uh, the field of view is just not good. And the video quality, it's not that great, like it's, it's just not good enough. I can't fly as well as I would with a regular FPV camera. So that's that's number one to me. If I can't actually enjoy what I'm doing, I'm not gonna run it. I don't really don't care for it. I don't do like whoop, cine whoop like style footage. So I don't really care for that. So this is one of my quads that I set up to do the kind of split thing. And I really do like this frame a lot. I do hope to work on it a little bit more in the future. These are actually two millimeter arms, but they feel really sturdy, really strong. They're separate arms, they're wishbone arms, or they're, they're um, connected arms, boomerang arms. And there's, it's just like, it's set up just like the floss style where there's a little center, center piece that really gives it uh, sturdiness and um, just takes the flex out of the center of the frame. And it's got these tall standoffs and it's just to fit the camera and it's really great. However, in order to make this thing fly really well, you kind of need big motors. Like you need 1306 motors just to make this work out. And at that weight, it's not really a light little quad. And I really like these light little quads that are around 100 grams or somewhere between 70 and like 130 grams all of weight because they're just so painless to run. Nobody bothers me. Nobody cares about me. Nobody nobody even pays attention to me. And so that's what I want. I live in LA. I don't have a choice. I have to do that. So I'm really focused on that kind of setup. And while this would be a great setup, it's also not original. There's tons of quads that are set up just like this and you could find out there. And maybe this frame will come out in the future, but I really don't care to have it come out because like I said, it's not original in any way and there's nothing special about it and it doesn't meet my weight requirements. Plus the split is not really great. So if you don't have enough power in the quad, it's gonna expend like half of its energy just maintaining its attitude in the air. And so you don't have a lot of input to have control. So when I flew this quad, it just felt so loose in the air, did not have the performance I was looking for at all, just the night and day difference compared to a toothpick quad like this. So now finally, let's talk about my uh, frames and why I've moved to this kind of frames just in general and um, not what performs best in the air. So I have a very high 
very high standard for the way I want my quads to fly, or my personal quads, things that I fly on a daily basis. And this is my daily setup. This is my favorite setup. This is my daily setup. These are the Flywoo uh, 2306 motors. I don't use the 22 size motors anymore because of the stupid annoying wobble issue in Betaflight. I absolutely despise the throttle curve of my 2306 motors, but I don't have a choice because my 22 size motors have this really awful wobble it's the lesser of two evils to go with the 2306. So I have moved to 2306. However, I still have some 2208 quads that I really love flying, but they don't have a lot of weight on top so that there's less wobble, wobble to them. I'm not even going to discuss that. But this is my daily flyer. This has uh, my Rush Tank VTX in there, which I absolutely love. It has a Talon F7 board, which I also love. Uh, the F F4 is also just as good. I also love the Radix board, which, oh God, I forgot. I haven't made a video about that either. The Radix board is also fantastic. Crossfire is an absolute must for me at this point. And if you look at the way I've built the quad, I've distributed where everything goes. I put the flight controller up front with the VTX and the, and the ESC in the middle, and I put the receiver in the back. And there's a very specific, very specific reason why I do this. And the camera's also up front. I put the flight controller up front with the camera because those are the most sensitive to electronic noise. When the receiver specifically comes in contact anywhere near the camera and flight controller, you get video noise, tons of video noise. And that's primarily because of the telemetry coming off the crossfire. So it also happens with FR Sky as well. But telemetry coming off the crossfire, you really will have to turn that off if you want to get rid of your video noise on your, on your racing quads because usually they're in very close proximity. Now, it doesn't happen to every quad, and you can't really fix it with a cap. You put the biggest cap you want on there. It doesn't really fix it at all. Uh, but yeah, that's the main reason why that stuff's in front and that's in the back. The VTX is actually less susceptible to electrical noise than the um, flight controller and the camera, so that's why it goes in the middle on top of the ESC, which is causing all the electrical noise <laughs> in addition to the um, receiver. So the receiver is causing the radio electrical noise, whereas the ESC is causing all the electrical electrical noise. So so the electrical electrical noise is, is helped by the cap and the receiver electrical noise can't really help by anything unless you have some weird notch filters or other filters on board, which the flight controller is supposed to have built in, but not all of them do, and not all of them work properly, and not all of them are properly tuned for the electrical noise that, or so the radio noise that you have on your quad. Whatever. Skip all that. So the reason why I have laid out my quad like this is because it's just so much easier to manage and maintain. And above everything else, if I can't maintain my, my quad, I'm not flying. So I need this thing to, number one, work for me. It's not the optimal layout. It's not the optimal build. I can get slightly better flight performance if I was to turn the battery sideways, change the layout, make it all weird, actually lighten the frame quite a bit. I do have a couple of lightweight versions of the glide frame, which I have debated releasing or not but I don't think I'm going to release. It is about 14, 15 grams lighter, but I'm, I'm not gonna release it because it's number one, not quite as durable as this frame, and it's a little bit of a pain to build and maintain because it's just a little bit tighter in there and it's a little bit harder to get things where you want them to be. And sure, we're gonna be moving to 20 by 20 um, ESEs and everything in the near future, I'm going to stick with this frame for now, and uh, there will be a lightweight version. The lightweight version that I've kind of settled upon will come out with one of these companies that I'm working on because they want a lightweight, ready-to-fly Acro Quad, which this is a perfect thing for them to use, and that will be an option in the future, but not right now. My primary frame is going to still be this one, even though it has that 15-gram deficit. And so as you see, because my things are all laid out in such a long, linear fashion, it's so easy for me to work on this thing. I almost never need to take the top plate off. And if I do take the top plate off, it's like I can access everything. I can swap even my ESC in such a short amount of time. It's so easy for me to maintain this. However, this particular quad, the center at least, has not changed in quite some time since long before the um, Talon F7 came out. That's the prototype of Talon F7 in there. And it's been in there for a long time. It's This quad has seen about seven or eight different sets of motors, but that's just me testing motors. And so, yeah, this has been exactly the way it has been since I first built it, which I'm really proud of, actually. I haven't destroyed this quad. So if you take a look at this frame, other things in it are that um, the one that's going to be coming out again, probably in the new future, will have these um, recessed screws, the countersunk screws on top. I'm also going to be using lock nuts, uh, sorry, the um, press nuts because people keep asking for press nuts. And I'm going to countersink all these screws on the bottom as well. I'm not going to countersink these screws because they're going to help with the rigidity. I hope that the countersunk screws on the bottom here don't kind of take away from the 
durability of this thing. Um, if you look, the carbon of the bottom plate, the reason why I have this bottom plate here, the carbon is running this way. It's not running in the front to back direction. It's actually going down the arms and that gives a whole lot of rigidity to the frame because the main plate is running front to back to give durability to the front, front to back dimension. Uh, if, when you feel this frame in your hands, it is absolutely, like, I broke my arms and it hurts my arms trying to flex this quad. Like, it is absolutely rigid. These are five millimeter arms. They have this deep chamfer on them, which I think I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna tell them to just keep this exact same deep chamfer on them, which is it just looks so nice on there. And so when you do need to switch an arm, it's two screws to swap an arm. You take out these two screws and it just, the arm slips straight out. There's a wide interconnection between the, um, the, the arm center over there like you can see the actual arm centers butt up against each other in a really wide fashion i made it extra wide so that there's even less play over time because over time the carbon compresses and all that happens the arms are very carefully tuned to break somewhere in this region and hopefully not right here or right here which is the most common areas for arms to break on quads um, the frame does accept 20 by 20 and 30 by 30. You can see there's two sets of 20 by 20 holes. That's because some 20 by 20 boards that are bigger than 20 by 20, they're about the size of a 30 by 30 ESC, have offset holes so that you can get it to fit between there a little bit easier. Now I'm just talking about the frame. So yeah, that's that. I just decided to talk because people asked me to just talk. So I hope this was really helpful and uh, informational for you guys. Uh, if you like this, let me know. I'll do it more. I have I can talk about anything forever, and that's really just skimming the surface. I haven't even talked about the dead cat style and how that changes things and how these longer standoffs change things. And I'm actually not going to be offering these longer standoffs in the kit anymore because almost nobody used them. Uh, but yeah, let's, let, let's leave it at that. Floss your teeth because flossing your teeth is very important. And uh, take care. Bye-bye.